God's Word, Matthew chapter 2. But I want to start with um, uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Is that okay? Everybody, how, any Chronicle of Narnia fans here? Chronicles of Narnia fans? Uh, quite a few of us here. Um, I have uh, my copy here, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, uh, $2.95 when we bought this new, uh, so you know how long ago we've had this around. But in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which is the best known, arguably, of the Chronicles of Narnia series, the children find their way, you'll know this story well, the children find their way uh, early on to the home of Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. That's winter in Narnia, which is a state that is unnatural for uh, this land because we know that is, it is under the spell of the, the white witch. It's under the spell of the white witch. And Beaver, though, he has a sense of things. He understands there to be hope, and he assures the children with this line. They say Aslan is on the move, perhaps already landed. And at hearing that, we read in the book that a very curious thing, this is from the book, a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. But the moment the beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite different. The fact that Aslan was on the move, the fact that his name had been spoken, the fact that hope had been expressed, brought about a life-altering change in each of the children, which the book goes on to describe. Now, again, if you know Narnia, you understand that it's allegory, and, and, and Aslan, of course, is the Christ figure in this beautiful allegory. And C.S. Lewis, the author, his point is clear. Christ, too, is on the move. After centuries of waiting, two millennia from the time of Abraham, from the point at which he had been called two millennia until the birth of the child in that village in Israel. That was the night that God moved in history to save us. He had indeed landed, to use Mr. Beaver's word. And as a result, everyone felt quite different. Do you feel quite different as a result of hearing the nativity story, of being aware of what God has done for us? Has your awareness of Christ caused you to feel quite different? As we see yet another ancient prophecy fulfilled in the passage that's in front of us this morning, and that's what this series has been about, looking at ancient prophecies that are fulfilled in the nativity story. And as we look at this passage today, will, will we take up the challenge to be on the move just as God is on the move? And so this is Matthew chapter 2, the last a few verses here, beginning at verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. All right, in your notes and on the screen, here's what we're going after. The coming of the Christ child makes me aware of several things. We're going to look at these. The coming of the Christ child makes me aware, first of all, that God is on the move. Now, this is plainly obvious by this point in the gospel narratives. By the time the family is returning from Egypt, all of the other aspects of the nativity have already taken place. By this time, Jesus is three, maybe four years old. To this point, we've had these angelic appearances. We've had dreams. We've had Elizabeth's pregnancy with John. We've had the journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. We had the shepherds witnessing the birth of Christ. We had Jesus' dedication at the temple, Simeon and Anna's prophecies over the child. We had the visit of the Magi, 
months and months later, the escape to Egypt, the slaughter of innocents that we looked at last week. And all of this, in every aspect of the nativity story, God has been on the move. You could legitimately take the theme of today's message and overlay it on all of the nativity narrative. So what we have now in these final verses, this final event in the nativity narrative is a further reminder of what God has been doing all along. Now look at verse 19, when Herod, but when Herod died, now to frame this up, our calendars are, you know, as they're dated in the year of our Lord, A.D., and so we're in 2022, and sometimes we think that Jesus was born at 1 or we think there was a year zero. Um, But actually, uh, historians, anthropologists tell us that Jesus was more likely born at 4 BC and that our calendar reckonings are a little bit off. Jesus was born at 4 BC. BC. There's a big discussion about when Herod died, but the most logical conclusion is that Herod died in 1 BC, and that would allow us, show us here, the uh, the age of Christ being, of Jesus being two uh, to three, three or four years old, give give or take a few months. So 4 B.C., Jesus is born, the escape to Egypt, Herod dies, 1 B.C. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. And so this is, this is another dream that Joseph receives in order to move the action along in the narrative, because everything seems to have paused at this point. In order to assure the safety of the child, it's like God pressed the pause button. But even in the pause, God was continuing to move. God was still working. His will was still being brought about. Things were happening exactly according to his plan. And the death of Herod would mark the next big shift, the next movement where the the family would move from Egypt back to Israel. And in fact, back to Galilee, where in Luke 2, we read this, uh, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God And man, he would grow up in this Galilean village in preparation for this messianic mission that we would have. And again, we look back on it, we know what the whole messianic mission was. At age 30, he would be commissioned to it. He would go and teach in the countryside. He would preach repentance. He would preach the kingdom of God. He would do miracles and impact people and draw crowds and and talk to people one-on-one. He would bring about a transformation as he presented the gospel to the world. And then he would give his life as a, sacrificial, uh, as a sacrificial lamb, dying on the cross, shedding his blood, and would be gloriously resurrected on the third day. That was his messianic mission. But for 30 years, almost 30 years, he's in Nazareth, growing up in his family. And it wasn't necessar- necessarily a something that people at the time understood It wasn't easy for people in Israel to see that God was at work. We look back on these accounts, and I was saying to Jordan, this is the 22nd year in a row that I'm preaching Christmas messages. There's only a very limited amount of material about Christmas. For 22 years, I've been preaching various aspects of the Christmas message. Some of you are even older than I am, and I'm quite old. And, 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 and we've heard this story over and over again. We know it. We hear the passages read and we go, I know that almost by heart. We have the benefit of looking back at the events of the first century. We, we look back with 2020 vision on all of these events. We know the details, but at the moment, right at this time right here, they didn't know. They didn't know God was at work. We look back on on the incarnation of Christ with awe and with wonder. Union of God and man in the sinless child who was born to a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Wow, it's so fantastic and wonderful. Then, for them, for those that were involved and who knew, nothing, nothing. Nothing for three decades. Jesus was just a, another toddler growing up in, in Bethlehem. The Magi had, had returned to their land after their incredible visit and, and going to Jerusalem and then heading to Bethlehem. 
And now they were back in Babylon doing magi things again. The shepherds who, who had seen the birth were back on the hillside with their flocks. Mary's relative Elizabeth, with whom she'd shared this moment when they reveled together in their prophetic pregnancies, they were now just two moms, changing diapers, wiping snotty noses, and wondering if they'd ever get a good night's sleep again. With all the miracles that had happened, everything seemed to just snap back to normal. And they could legitimately ask the question, was God really on the move? It would be easy for us to be so engrossed with the normal happenings of life that we don't see God in any of it. We don't see him answering prayer. We don't see the way he's healing people. We don't see the provision, the way he leads, the way he saves. That we miss God giving peace to people, providing hope, offering joy, demonstrating his love. We don't see God changing lives. We, we don't see people finding comfort in him, being strengthened by him, receiving the wisdom they need to make decisions and to live day by day. Again, we may miss these things because we're living in the mundane, in the ordinary, in the normal. But let me, let me say this. If that's you, if you're not seeing God move, could I suggest that the problem is not with God, who's very much doing all of these things, every moment of every day, in the lives of countless millions of people, could I suggest that the problem is not you if you don't see, is not God, but is you if you're not seeing these things happening. But if we give ourselves to understanding the scriptures, cultivating a life of prayer and of worship, if we're committed to serving as he's instructed us to serve, as we, as we give ourselves to the community of God's people, then we will see God move. We'll see him do all of these things in abundance and far more than we could ever think or imagine, in fact, in the lives of those around us and also in our own lives. And so the coming of the Christ child makes me aware that God is on the move. But let's not be naive as we acknowledge that. Because in as, much, in as much as God is on the move, notice this next, Satan also is on the move. Satan knows he's defeated. We've been spending this time in the book of Revelation lately, and we've gotten this picture of all of eternity, the timeline, and we're getting this picture of these visions of everything that God has done in the past. For us, what's in the past, for us, what's in the future, everything that's rooted in eternity, we're getting this big picture of, of all of it. And as we look at it all, to the extent that we understand it, please, please know that Satan knows the scriptures better than you and I do. So Satan knows he's defeated. He knows the end is coming for him. He knows that by, this, by the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, his doom was sealed. Yet his intention is to subvert as best he can the plans and purposes of God before he is finally and ultimately dealt with. And he's a player in the nativity story. And we don't necessarily see him in the story when you, when you do the pageants, you know, the children's pageants. In the children's pageants, you have the shepherds and you've got the magi. You, you've got Mary and Joseph. You, you've got the innkeeper who's never mentioned in the Bible. The little drummer boy. All kinds of animals that aren't mentioned anywhere in the Bible with respect to the nativity. So the donkey. There's whole movies about the donkey. But the one 
the one person you don't ever see depicted is Satan. He's there? Of course he is. But not so obviously. In fact, he plays his part through his proxy, his human proxy, King Herod. King Herod, uh, we saw last week in the appearance of the Magi in Jerusalem, these, these Magi appear and uh, they're kingmakers, they're advisors to kings, they're influential, they're rich, they're from a foreign country. They, they appear in this massive entourage in Jerusalem because they've seen this star, they know it comes from the Jewish prophecies, and so they see the star and they go, well, that means, based on the prophecies, seeing this star, that a king is born in Israel. So they pack up all their stuff and their big entourage and they head out the hundreds and hundreds of kilometers it would take to get to Jerusalem, they go to the capital where the palace is because a king has been born, and that just makes sense. But as they enter into the city, it causes this huge uproar. And Herod, who is the king, is a little bit shocked to find out a new king has been born because he doesn't know anything about this. Plus, he considers this king to be a threat. Why? Because Herod has no Davidic blood. He does not sit on the throne of Israel legitimately. And so a king born as a result of a prophecy would be a threat to his throne. And so this causes great upset in the palace and and with Herod and his people. And so he sends his soldiers, and we saw this last week in Jordan's message. He sends his soldiers to Bethlehem. because He found out from the prophecies that's where the Messiah would be born. And the soldiers kill all the male children of age, all the toddlers down to infants, in order to wipe out the threat. Now, this is wholly consistent with who historians tell us Herod was. He was a a tyrant of the worst kind. In summing up Herod's life, Josephus, the Jewish historian, said he was a man of great barbarity, toward all men equally. I mean, he was as nasty to one person as another and a slave to his passions. The accounts of the atrocities that Herod uh, performed are horrific. His excesses are well documented. He was married 10 times. He had children from many, if not all of these wives. He was known uh, for many, many atrocities, but uh, worst of all, it would seem, Although the murdering of innocents was bad, um, he murdered his own sons. And so no surprise that he had no conscience about doing it in Bethlehem. He murdered his own sons because of his paranoia, thinking they were plotting to overthrow them. And I tell you all of this and spare you all the details of his life because um, it's obvious that he was the perfect representative of Satan. As, as were many many despots and and kings and dictators before him and and many more uh, that came after him. Now, this is, is, again, having mentioned Revelation in the time that we've spent in this book to to further make the point um, of of Satan on the move, um, as we've studied Revelation and, and more recently we were in Revelation chapter 12, and let me remind you about something that we saw there. Revelation 12, this is the last part of verse 4 and verse 5, And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now again, in the visions that John saw, we understand that we're seeing some events that happened in the past, some events that were happening and are happening in the present, and some events that are as yet future to us. Revelation is filled with all three of those uh, pictures for us. And in this picture, we see the same kind of thing. There's something here that's being recounted that John is seeing that happened already and something that we are yet waiting for in the future. And in part, what this passage speaks to is what Herod sought to do. He tried to devour the child. But God sent the family to Egypt for safety. He protected them. And I don't know if any of our, we have a number of people in our church who are of Egyptian descent, and I just want to say thank you on behalf of the people of humanity to Egypt for taking in the Messiah and protecting him. I feel like Egypt 
And Egyptians, that is your greatest legacy. It's not the pyramids, though you brag about those things all the time. You protected the Messiah. You kept the Messiah safe. But now, with all of Satan's regional representatives taken care of and out of the picture, it was now safe to go home, and Joseph was given that message. And so the angel says in the dream, verse 20, rise, take up the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those, plural, part of Herod's entourage, who sought the child's life, are dead. Now, that day of, of utter and complete and ultimate safety is something we're still waiting for. That time when no one is left to threaten us. That day is coming, it's not yet. Our final hope is imminent. Jesus is returning and we await that day. But until that day, we must remain vigilant about the evil one. The Apostle Peter wrote in his letter, this is 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he said, he's speaking to Christians. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Why? Why, as Christians, must we be sober-minded? He says, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to, what's the word? Devour. The same word. So you see, if Satan through his proxy can't devour the child because God has protected the child, then Satan will devour the people, the church, Christians, believers. He'll seek to devour you and me if he can. And so we have to be aware of the evil one's presence and power and his influence in this world. And we, we can't for a minute as Christians let up on the gas. Because he's not letting up on the gas. He's on the move, seeking someone to devour, and his, me his methods are so subtle. Don't think that evil is coming at you full force and so obviously. Oh no, subtlety, subtle deceit is Satan's best play. Addictions start so innocently, often just leisurely, and then we can't shake them. They grip and consume our lives. Fantasies turn to flirting, and then a fling that causes a family to fail. The having, having something, transforms into wanting it and more. So we pursue it at all costs. Any good gift from God can be perverted into an idol that we worship. The natural order of things, what we, what we just look at and know to be true is now being turned on its head so that now it's only about your truth and my truth and not the truth. It's subtle. Satan's on the move every minute of every day. Students, he's, he's on the move in the schools that you go to. Elementary, secondary, and post-secondary, he's on the move. He's on the move every minute of every day in the shows and movies we watch, in every reel that you see on social media. Satan is on the move in all the news sources that we give our attention to, and listen, we have to be aware. We can't afford to be complacent about these things. Now, let's just follow the logic here. If God is on the move and Satan is on the move, then it would seem logical that I, too, should be on the move. You and I should be moving as well. We have to respond in a way that demonstrates that we're taking all of this seriously. That I see God and Satan on the move and that I realize I can't simply be standing still lest I get caught in the crossfire in this spiritual war and I become a victim 
a casualty of it rather than a victor in the middle of it. Now notice three ways that I can get moving, three ways for you to get moving. First, I must be actively obeying God's word. This is what Joseph models for us in verse 21. Notice, he, he's received this dream. The dream is a word from God, a specific word from God for him. So I must be actively obeying the word of God. This is what, what Joseph hears, he, or he does. He rose, verse 21, he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. He did so at the hearing of the word of God. He didn't hesitate. He just went for it this angel communicating with him in a dream. Now, I hear that. I hear about God communicating in a dream, and I go, that's so sketchy. Doesn't that seem sketchy to you that God communicates in dreams? I mean, let's agree on a couple of things here. Can I put up a couple of things in front of you that we could maybe agree on? Thank you. Okay. Pausing for dramatic effect. Here's the first thing that I think we could agree on. The overnight dreams you and I have, like when we're in our REM sleep, okay, the overnight dreams that you and I have are way too weird to be from God. Can we agree on that? Yeah? In fact, this is exactly how God has designed us. I got a little quote here from a researcher, PhD guy from UCAL Berkeley, and he said this. His name is Matthew Walker. He said, this is pretty commonly understood about dreams. Time spent in dream sleep is what heals. REM, that's rapid eye movement sleep, that kind of dreaming appears to take the painful sting out of difficult, even traumatic emotional episodes experienced during the day, offering emotional resolution when you awake the next morning. I mean, this is like God's reset button for us to get a good night's sleep. This is the equivalent of my Mac isn't working well. I'm just going to press the power button, shut it all down, and reboot it. This is getting REM sleep and having those weird dreams that we have is our way of processing all of that so we can wake up the next morning and be sane. Can we agree with that? And here's something else with respect to that. Joseph would have had the same kind of weird dreams that you and I normally have. Joseph would have, he'd go to bed at night, he'd dream about donkeys on the roof, or he'd, or he'd dream once again about, I cut the boards too short, because that's what carpenters dream about. Here's the second thing. So overnight dreams that you and I have are way too weird to be from God. Secondly, when God speaks in a dream, you're going to know it. It's not going to be weird. It's going to be clear, and you're going to wake up, and you're going to go, God spoke to me. It's going to be that clear. There's going to be no doubt. Now, here's the thing, because they're very uncommon. God can communicate in dreams, but they're super, super, super uncommon. Most of our dreams are just weird dreams. Because we don't need a dream from God to know what to do. Because he's already printed it all in his book. And he gave us the book. And he said, you know what? Just go ahead and do this. Y'all don't need a dream. You have a book. Joseph didn't have the book. And Joseph needed something very specific. He needed to hear something very specific that he needed to do. And so you and I simply need, here's what I want to say about this. You and I simply need to obey what's in the word of God and that by will, by, by that, by default, will get us moving. If We just obey the word of God. Because you can't, you can't read this. Be open to the spirit of God and not be moved by it. Hebrews 4 tells us that the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's living, it's active, and if you say, Holy Spirit, teach me from this book, and when you read it, it will transform your life, and you will not be able to stand still because it will move you and compel you forward for Christ. All right, notice we are to be 
obeying the word, secondly, and carefully discerning the times. So, so not only hearing what God has to say to us, but now taking that and looking at the landscape and looking at what's going on in our lives and being able to discern things about it so that we have the mind of God about these things. So Joseph gets the word, verse 20, to go back to Israel, and he's not given any specific place. Just go back to Israel. And so it, it seems that it was left to him to decide where he was going to go. And as he was thinking about it, it seemed just logical that he would go back to Bethlehem. That's where they had established their lives after Jesus was born. They were there for up to two years. No doubt they had made friends there. We know they, had, they were in a house while they were there. He, he probably started his business and was working and, and doing carpentry. They knew people at the synagogue. They had integrated into life. Not only that, both Mary and Joseph were in the line of David, and this was the city of David. This was their people, and this was their place. Not to mention the proximity to Jerusalem, just a few kilometers down the road. They knew who their son was, and maybe in their minds they thought, you know what, it would be handy just to have the center of Israeli worship and life just up the road. So this is what's going through Joseph's mind as he's traveling from Egypt to Israel. And yet when Joseph heard some news, he felt like that wasn't the best thing to do. Verse 22, when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, and the thing about Archelaus was, he was as bad as his father. The historians all say he was just as bad as his dad. And so Joseph, hearing that, he was afraid to go there, the verse goes on, and he had, he had what we might call a check in his spirit. There's just something about this. He's just going, you know what? I just don't feel like Bethlehem's the right place to go. And once more, God spoke to him again in a dream, being warned in a dream. He withdrew to the district of Galilee. They went home to Nazareth. And Joseph was able to discern what was happening around him because he was a man of the word, he was sensitive to the things of the spirit, he was a devoted worshiper of Yahweh. We know from earlier in this same um, uh, gospel, back in Matthew chapter 1, when, when, when he heard that, that, that Mary was pregnant, he knew he wasn't the father, he thought Mary had cheated on him, he, he was going to divorce her, but then Matthew 1 tells us that he was a just man, he was a righteous man, he didn't want to hurt Mary. And the fact that he was a just and righteous man was the thing that allowed God to use him in this way. So listen, when you're attentive to the word, that's the starting point, attentive to the word. When you're attentive to the word, you're gonna be sensitive to the spirit of God about the world around you. You're gonna be able to look at things around you, be able to discern that's evil, that's good, that's from God, that's not. We need to give ourselves to these things. And then all of this applies, thirdly, all of this applies while normally living my life. See, Joseph wasn't an extraordinary person. Mary was not an extraordinary person. Mary did not have a glowing halo over her head, despite much of the artwork you've seen. They were as ordinary and unassuming as any single person in this room. Anyone watching the live stream right now, they're just normal, normal people. So verse 23 says simply, he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. He fulfilled God's will so that he went there so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he, Jesus, would be called a Nazarene. Now, little, teeny, little interpretive problem here. In that, we have no Old Testament prophecies that say that Jesus would be called a Nazarene. So what do we do with this? Well, the commentators all agree that this was a general prophecy that was known to many, passed down through oral tradition, but never actually inspired to be written in the scriptures, that many, many prophets would have preached that Jesus would have come from Nazareth or that the Messiah would have come from Nazareth. And that prophecy was consistent with the biblical idea that the Messiah would rise from humble circumstances, which is throughout the prophecy. The Messiah would come from humble circumstances. And so he came from, from little thought of Galilee. He came from much, much maligned 
Nazareth. In fact, you'll remember that later on when Jesus is, is confronted by the religious leaders and they find out that he's from Nazareth, they say, can anything good come from Nazareth, right? That's their question because they know nothing good ever comes from these little podunk little towns. And I thought this would be like a great spot just so we would understand this to insert the name of a town that would sub in for being like small and insignificant and no one thinks much of, but I don't want to offend anyone unnecessarily, so I'll just say Cleveland. Can anything good come from Cleveland? Does everyone get it? See, that's what it was like. It was, he was to come from a place that people didn't think much of. He was to come from a place of obscurity, away from power, away from the center of things. This is, this is something Isaiah had predicted 600 years before Joseph and Mary made this trip back to Nazareth. This is what Isaiah said in that beautiful messianic chapter, Isaiah 53. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. I mean, Jesus nailed this part of the incarnation so well. He was such an ordinary human being that the people of Nazareth, this small town in Galilee, who all grew up with him, who knew him well, didn't know he was the Messiah, didn't know he was the Son of God. In fact, when he did go back to Nazareth after he had started his his public ministry, he went back and he went into the synagogue and he, the Isaiah scroll was put in front of him and he read a passage out of Isaiah and then he said, in your hearing, this prophecy is now fulfilled. In other words, I'm the fulfillment of what I just read and people's minds were blown in the synagogue in which he had grown up. The people said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Isn't this Joe's boy? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get these things? Their minds were blown. They didn't expect at all that Jesus, he had he had nothing about him that should cause anyone to believe that he was who he was now claiming to be. He lived such a normal and or ordinary life for those first three decades. Completely unremarkable. Here's why we all need to hear this. Why we need to look at what Mary and Joseph are doing here and emulate this. Francis Shaver said in a, in a book, in his book called No Little People, he said this, there are no little people in God's sight. So there are no little places. To be wholly committed to God in the place where God wants him, this is the creature glorified. This is the way of the Christian. And so God wants to use us. In, in, in the ordinary life that we have and are living. Whatever, wherever, wherever God has placed you, that is your place of service and mission. I want you to think about that right now. Wherever God has placed you, wherever you are right now, that's where God wants you to do service, to be of service to him and to do mission. If you will respond to this call to do mission in these places, then your home, your neighborhood, your schools, your workplaces, and the church will provide you with a lifetime of opportunities for the gospel. You need not look any further than these places to make an impact for the kingdom. In fact, he's looking for ordinary people in ordinary places. 
to carry out the mission. And there are no excuses. We can't be in those places and then offer excuses to God as to why, why we can't do this ministry. God actually wants you with your faults and your failures. This room is filled. Every person watching right now, myself included, all of us are people with many faults and failures. It's true, right? He wants you with your faults and failures. He wants you with your messy past and your chaotic present. You don't need to sort those things out first. Be on mission for him where you are and just as you are. He wants you in your weakness. He wants you in your weariness. And he wants you in your weirdness. okay to laugh at that. He wants you with your anxieties and your fears. Because it's in this lowly place of brokenness that God's grace is made manifest and God's power is made obvious. The Apostle Paul struggled with this prayed to God repeatedly about his weakness. And God said to him in 2 Corinthians 12, he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I have you right where I want you. Weakness is what Joseph and Mary brought to the table. Weakness is what you and I bring to the table. God is on the move. He always has been, and he still is. And no matter your situation, no matter who you are, you ought to be on the move with him. Let me pray. Father, I would, I would pray right now for your Holy Spirit to move and to convince and convict each one who's hearing and has heard this message. Whether here in the room or watching online, God, I pray that you would be working in a, in a powerful way in each person's life. Father, I think about the potential and what would happen if every single one of us pressed in to what we just heard, to be on the move with you and the impact that that would have fathers as we just think about the next week, the next seven days heading up into Christmas and all of the opportunities that are in front of us to give, to help, to serve, to love on people, to present the gospel to them. Father, I pray that there would be a great movement. The hundreds and hundreds who have heard this message today, Father, if every one of us fell under the conviction of the Spirit, what an impact that would make. And so God, I pray that. I pray that you would move in a powerful way, that you would pour out your grace, that you would use us in our weakness, God, so that you alone receive the glory for all of this. We thank you for these things. We thank you for speaking to us. We thank you for the Messiah, Jesus. Pray in his strong name.